welcome to everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this, what I think is the first session. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Dr. Nicholas Morrison. I'm uh, a non-resident fellow at the ECPS. I'm a research fellow at Deakin University, and I also teach uh, a number of politics subjects, including uh, at times populism at the Australian Catholic University here in Melbourne, Australia. So I'll just be moderating today. Um, in fact, today's lecture, of course, is presented by Dr. Angula Akupulu. And it's on a very important and foundational topic, which is definitions and varieties of populism. And I think the reason this topic is so important is because while populism has become an important part of our world, it remains notoriously difficult to define and in some ways to understand. Um, sometimes we hear people call politicians that we, we dislike or they dislike populists. And of course, abstract concepts like populism tend to be quite difficult to define. But it is important, I think, that we, we all understand what we mean or what scholars in particular mean when they describe an individual politician or a political movement or party as populist. So it's also important that we try to understand the relationship that populism shares with other political ideologies and ultimately its relationship with democracy. You know, all about all of those things and more today. Um, so before we begin, before I hand things over, I'll say a few words about our speaker today. So Dr. Melkopoulou is a tenured senior lecturer in political theory at Lund University and adjunct professor at both Sala and uh, Iveskula Universities in Sweden. Uh, she has been a Princeton University Seeger Fellow and an Eric Allard Fellow at the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study. Her research interests lie at the intersection of democratic theory, history, political thought, and electoral politics. Dr. Malkopoulou is an expert in democratic theory, especially in the fields of democratic self-defense and compulsory voting. And she's the author of the book, The History of Compulsory Voting in Europe. Um, before I hand things over, I'll just say a little about how today's set structured. Um, so Dr. Mokopoulou will speak uh, and then there'll be a short break of 15 minutes and after that we'll have a QA and a session uh, running for roughly 45 minutes. So I, I strongly encourage you all to, to perhaps write down a question during the talk or think about it during the break. Ask uh, your questions following the speech in the Q&A session. So I will now hand things over to our speaker. Thank you, Nicolas, and thank you to ECPS for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very happy to be talking to such a broad audience of students from so many fields and so many different countries on something that I have been reading about and studying for quite some time. So I'm looking forward to share with you my thoughts and ideas and knowledge about this topic. But for this to happen, I have to start sharing my screen. Just a moment, thank you. Here you go. So uh, this is an introduction to populism, right? So I'm, and as a political theorist, I will um, focus, of course, on the conceptual and um, um, an abstract, if you like, aspect of populism. And the, the lecture is structured as such. First, we will talk the first half, basically about uh, what populism is and the different approaches to understanding it. Uh, and then we will move on to discuss its relations with other, its relation with other ideologies. Uh, and last, we will talk also about its relation to democracy. And now, so what is populism? And First of all, why, why do, we, do we care about populism? Nicholas already uh, hinted at certain uh, reasons and, uh, and it has been really the buzzword of the past years. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps the reason why it's so uh, attractive is not only its presence, but also that it is puzzling and that is often wrongly used and there are different contested uh, definitions and conceptions of populism and what it means. Uh, it has been used to describe different things also, not just um, a, a movement that is a populist movement or a party, 
but also individuals or uh, events like Brexit was kind of a populist event. So uh, it has been uh, um, used for different, to describe different uh, situations. Um, and uh, another kind of tr uh, interesting thing about it is that it has both supporters and opponents. Uh, some people really uh, speak for populism and think it's it's cel and celebrated as a good thing, and and others uh, really put all their energy in fighting what they what populism uh, uh, what populism brings to especially democracy. So uh, it is very divisive as a topic as well. Um, but so, so scholars have put some attention, <laughs> a lot of attention in the past years on populism. And to some degree, there is a consensus about what it means. Uh, and not, not many would dispute that, that it somehow centers around a division, a conceptual division uh, between the people on one hand and an elite on the other. So populism understands uh, the populist kind of uh, um, public politician or the populist, uh, uh, you know, citizen understands the world as divided and societies as divided between the people and the elite. So that's, that's kind of a, um, a fundamental characteristic. Uh, but then again, but then there are different approaches to populism, okay? And um, they are basically distinguished in three types, the ideational, the strategic, and the discursive, discursive performative. Now, the first one sees, um, uh, is, um, um, uh, these three approaches, uh, let me first mention that they, sh they have, differences that are both theoretical, but also methodological and even epistemological. So they rely on different principles of understanding, uh, of interpreting a phenomenon. And you will see what I mean in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment. So the ideational approach would view populism as an ideology. Uh, and, uh, and this is, if you like, the mainstream approach, which is shared by um, a lot of political scientists, if not most of them, I, I would say, and uh, part of the of the theorists as well. And uh, <clears throat> uh, and then you have the strategic approach, which would view populism as a strategy, or, or we would say as a practice, whereas the first would see it as an ideology, the second would see it as a practice. As, an, as, as, a, as a mode of organization. And then the third, the discursive approach would see it as a type of discourse uh, or performance, because this has also sub, sub um, uh, type, the performative. Uh, now we will talk in detail about each of them. Uh, first, the ideational, right? Now this one focuses on what populists believe. Uh, and, uh, and, and they, looking at that, they come to the conclusion that populism is a so-called thin-centered ideology, right? Um, this means that uh, uh, this approach is um, shared by, as I said, uh, um, uh, the, the mainstream political scientists working on populists, like Rovira Kaltvers, my friend, who we see there with the glasses and the beard, and Cass Mude but also Jan Werner Müller. So this, these books you have probably seen, they would share this approach, the ideational approach. Um, and they are in, uh, inspired by, to some extent, uh, Giovanni Sartori and his, uh, um, his work on, uh, on concept formation, uh, as well as by Michael Frieden and his work on ideologies. So uh, to understand this approach, we need to know what is an ideology and what Michael Frieden says in an ideology, because that lies behind this approach. So an ideology in this, uh, in this in kind of in the ideology studies research that is ongoing uh, is understood as a set of ideas which supports or contests political arrangements and processes and provides plans of action 
and, and strategies for mobilizing <clears throat> mass political activity. So it's not just a set of ideas like a philosophy or theory would be, but it has a kind of plan of how to put them in motion and make uh, uh, and change uh, po uh, political societies on the base of these ideas. So that's the, 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 the what defines an ideology that it includes both theory and practice, if you like. Uh, and populism then would be such and I, um, such a combination of ideas and uh, plans for action. Um, now, uh, what specifically Michael Frieden says about ideology is that an ideology would consist of certain key concepts. Um, for example, liberalism as an ideology would have liberty as a key concept, so on. And some are in each ideology, some concepts are more important than others. But every key concept uh, is, ha, can take different meanings. So uh, liberty means something else for liberals uh, and uh, something else for socialists. So, and what an ideology does is to try to push for a specific conception of a key concept. So liberals want to promote uh, an understanding of, uh, of liberty as being uh, uh, an, something that an individual has, something that uh, is um, uh, usually is the, the absence of a constraint or equality is a good example uh, where the liberals would understand equality as the formal political and legal equality, one man, one vote, that's equality for the liberals, whereas the socialists would take equality to be uh, defined in social terms. So uh, that unless we have some kind of social equality, we cannot talk about equality. Or the feminists would talk about sexual equality. So each ideologist tried to, to, to pin down a specific conception of a key concept. And what do populists do uh, So, if uh, from uh, as an ideology? First of all, uh, so we return to, um, to the previous slide. Uh, we need to understand why it is called a thin-centered ideology. It has all the uh, features we talked uh, about just now, but it's a thin-centered one, which means that it has an ability to cohabit with other more comprehensive ideologies in order to be filled with content. It lacks uh, its own kind of uh, substantial views of, of, different, of different concepts, so it has to be um, to... To, 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 to come in pair, let's say, with some, some other ideology, uh, which in this other ideology would then be crucial to promote um, uh, uh, a political project that is appealing to a broader public. So when uh, you, you have populism combined with nationalism, then, um, uh, uh, so the, nation, the nationalist kind of rhetoric or the nationalist ideas would work as a vehicle to promote, uh, um, to co-promote co uh, populism and the other way around. Um, of course, Michael Frieden would disagree with, uh, no, of course, you would don't know that, but Michael Frieden does disagree and he, does, he thinks that populism is actually not an ideology at all. It's so thin that it shouldn't count as an ideology. But as I said, most people would say that it is a thin center ideology. It is an ideology itself, but it has to go always with another one. It, its core features as an ideology though, is, uh, are the belief that I mentioned earlier that the societies are divided between the people and the elite. Uh, the idea that the people is homogenous and unified. It's one collective unity. And uh, the idea, the, the, the evalu evaluative, if you like, uh, uh, principle that the people is morally pure, um, whereas the elite is always corrupt and evil. Uh, and this, these are core characteristics of the populist ideology. Uh, but as you see, they don't, say, uh, they don't say much about equality or liberty. So that's why they have to be combined with others. They're kind of... Uh, some would say even stylistic um, aspects of an ideology. Um, all right, so uh, 
So we now discussed what is the perhaps mainstream approach. And that's, as I said, mainly present in political science research on populism uh, and uh, to some degree political theory. And then you, we have the strategic approach, and this would emphasize, would emphasize what populists do and how they pursue and sustain power. So, in that, uh, from in that, uh, in that sense, populism is a mode of political practice as opposed to ideology, and a form, a specifically, a form of uh, mobilization. Now, this approach draws a lot on sociology and historical sociology, and it's shared by, by these uh, and, and pushed by this uh, type of scholars who work in sociology departments like Kurt Weyland or that, uh, the, the gentleman in the lower and, and, uh, and um, sorry, um, and, and Robert Janssen, who is the one with the glasses in, uh, in the States. And for them, uh, uh, populism would have also uh, core characteristics, but that which emerge more only by observing what is being done, how exactly uh, uh, populists mobilize uh, the masses. And that's the personalistic leadership. So um, a certain style of leadership that is focused on the person of the leader and that the appeals to the people are unmediated. And for example, through Twitter directly and without uh, you know, making use of uh, the party as a kind of, uh, um, as a plateau or as a, as a forum for uh, um, appealing to the people. Um, so this is a strategic approach is um, often, uh, yeah, it's not very, it's not the mainstream one, let's say. And uh, last but not least is the discursive approach. And that one would focus a lot on what populists say or do uh, and would define populism as a discourse or as a political style. Here, the, uh, this one draws on the Essex School of Discourse Analysis and Ernesto Glaclau, and I will say more about it in a moment, as well on the linguistic on linguistics and specific, specifically Ruth Bodak and the critical discourse analysis schools that um, focus on, on language. Uh, for them, the core features are the fact that the people versus the elite is something that is constructed. This understanding is constructed through discourse by repeating or by po um, posing uh, um, uh, real, uh, describing and, and talking about it in, in uh, the people in certain terms and with certain language, it constructs this division. And, uh, and, and that comes with the construction of political identity of the people as a kind of political, uh, political agency, if you like. Uh, and uh, uh, what is key also here are the performative non-verbal and symbolic aspects that this is actually really uh, at the core of what populism is to use a certain style to wear the you know trump wearing the red uh, jockey uh, that makes him look like a like your neighbor and uh, and, and the the performative aspect uh, of uh, of the populists uh, the populist politician uh, would be really uh, key to understand what populism is, according to the those who go for the discursive approach. Um, now, uh, let's see now uh, what is the, um, the, the 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 main project, if you like, behind this discursive approach that is very much talked about. And I'm talking about uh, um, Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe that you see here, who used to be also a couple in life and now Laclau is, is uh, deceased. Um, and they have, um, they're really behind this um, uh, discursive approach, but also the, the theory of populism, uh, the main or only theory of populism that we have at our disposal really. Now, what is this theory about? And I'm not saying that this is what populism is. I'm saying that this is one of the really um, good to know, <laughs> important to know theories of populism. Uh, and I will also explain why it is so important. So they 
uh, uh, Laclau already in the 80s talked about populism being a discourse that works as a political strategy that divides society in two camps, as we said before, a people who is mobilized against an oligarchy that is, that is neoliberal. We already see here now the post-Marxist um, um, elements that, that are key for this uh, theory. Uh, post, uh, yeah, post-Marxist. Um, and, uh, and this constructed, as I mentioned earlier, form of identity of the people having a certain political identity, uh, the people um, is, um, who is the people basically? And he says that the people are constructed through a chain of equivalences between heterogeneous democratic demands. Basically you see people like real people coming out in the streets to demonstrate and one is calling for sexual liberation and the other is calling for higher wages and the other is calling for LGBTQ rights and another one is calling for, uh, I don't know, higher welfare, uh, pay, pay, uh, unemployment benefits and, and so on. So that heterogeneous demands and they're all democratic. And if we establish a chain of equivalences between them, what they share, and they share an opposition to a certain elite, elite that's corrupt and neoliberal, he would say. Uh, but all, not only because LGBTQ rights uh, uh, demonstrators would not have a neo problem with neoliberalism specifically, uh, they would, uh, or sorry, they would not be working class only, they would be from other classes. So it's not a working class that mobilizes, it's people from different strands of life that would share demands different demands that are equivalent, heterogeneous but equivalent. And this is the people, he says. None of these demands is central, but all of them together bring, bring, bring these people together and make them the people in the populist sense, the populist people. For, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's clear that for them, populism is a good thing, right? In, in this theory. Um, and now Mufa came, comes with uh, explaining, if you like, what is, what, how this works now, how we came to this moment. So in the 60s, we had uh, the crisis of the post-World War II welfare state and new social movements. And as a reaction to that, we had the new right, especially Thatcher, which built a neoliberal hegemony. And that's the problem, she says, that this neoliberal hegemony that kind of swept away the social democratic parties in the 90s that uh, became more turned to the center, created a vacuum that populist parties then uh, took over in the 2000s, 2010s. So now we live in the populist moment we are in a, uh, the, where the neoliberal hegemony is in crisis. And, um, and that's because uh, there, um, uh, there are a lot, there's a great number of, uh, of unsatisfied demands, social, economic, political, legal, all sorts, that because of what has been called post-democracy, the fact that democracy doesn't work well, it's more, it more works better for the elites, it's run by the EU, for example, is run by close elite circles and so on. And uh, uh, because they claim popular sovereignty and equality are undermined, we see an oligarchization of society. So, uh, so this, this kind of gives a momentum to populism and uh, uh, and social, democ social democratic parties fail to register these demands as democratic and they depict them as extremist. But it's not only the, the right populist, right wing populists that uh, uh, kind of put them forward. It's, uh, it's, it's also, they also come from the left. And, and here we see now the division between left and right populism that Mouffe says the left should uh, articulate these claims in progressive and egalitarian terms, whereas the right-wing right, populi right -wing populism articulates them in um, kind of nativist terms. Uh, they have uh, uh, not been uh, scholars sitting in their desks in the universities only, but they have been very influential in politics. Uh, um, in uh, Ernesto Leclau comes from Argentina, so left-wing populism in uh, uh, in, the, in uh, Latin America. But then uh, Chantal Mouffe has been close to Podemos in Spain, and, Jean and the other 
person you see here with her is uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France, the leader of the left party, and of course Syriza in Greece. So they theory has really been, it has really kind of been at the, uh, at the um, uh, has inspired actual political parties that even came, uh, became uh, government parties like Syriza. Um, what she says is basically that since, um, and here, and I will come back a little bit to that when we, when I discuss the relation of populism to socialism, but, uh, but for them, um, the socialist project has to be articulated in democratic terms, in radical democratic terms, and should become uh, a fight for democratic equality. Uh, since this, these demands have, have anyway been articulated in, in, in the language of democracy, we, uh, we should turn the whole social pro risk project towards, um, um, towards a project of radicalizing democracy, radically reforming, not getting rid of representative institutions, but radically reforming them, uh, especially targeting economic liberalism, uh, she, she would say. Now, and here we see her sitting with, with uh, Varoufakis and, um, and uh, Alexis Tsipras and, uh, and a professor in London there who, is, who, who became a, a M, M, MP for Syriza in Greece, Kostas Duzinas. Um, now, uh, to give a little more substance to her views, so how is the people constructed? Uh, it is basically a combination of, as we said, multiple demands, and that would be workers' demands, ecological demands, very important for them, but also uh, other democratic demands, and all of them against a neoliberal hegemony that is destructive uh, uh, of this claim, of these claims, and this this kind of groups of the population, and. Um, and she stresses that this, uh, her approach is anti-essentialist. And that means that she doesn't describe the people as homogenous, as they would say. A lot of uh, people uh, criticizing populism would say that populism presents people as homogenous. Say we're doing the exact opposite. We say that, that the people is consisting of different heterogeneous demands. And this is anyway a discursive construction. We don't say that people is one, we construct it as one composed by different demands. So it's not essentialism of the people as, as, um, uh, as, as, as people being, um, having an essential form. And they want to um, uh, kind of uh, promote the idea of, of the radical citizen who is uh, um, actively involved in the political community and challenges relations of domination in different types of social relations. Uh, and what is also key is, is that this should all work through um, a, a strategy of mobilizing affects and emotions and, and through them create political identifications. So, um, and that's, uh, and this uh, uh, theory of populism has uh, also been influenced by psychoanalytic research in Lacan and so on, uh, where emotions take a center stage. And that's good, they say. Um, now, um, why people would say, why did, does she call this populism? Is it not some kind of social democratic type of project uh, you know, for the 21st century? And she says, well, what's, what's, what's the problem with populism? It has, it has negative connotations, but only in Western Europe, not in the US, uh, well, at least not historically, uh, it's something else what happened the last 10 years. Um, and it should be understood as a strategic strategic counter hegemonic struggle that's what populism is for her and uh, and the left the left in left populism is uh, important because all the other lefts have been disappointing she says it is more progressive and transversal than the kind of classic or traditional left because you know the social democratic left would appeal to a social class 
uh, and uh, and they don't do that. They don't see um, the, the people as as being a social class, but as I said, different multiple heterogeneous demand, demands, unsatisfied demands. Um, and uh, because, and it's left, however, because it uh, highlights equality and social justice as central values. And it's also partisan, uh, as, she's, as I said, she's very vocal also in, in the political um, sphere uh, on, on populism being, kind of uh, incorporating in party, specific party strategies. So that's why it's left. Um, and that kind of is linked to her theories of agonistic democracy. I'm not going into that. Mm. Now, so, so here we have the three approaches and I have been very, have given a lot of detail uh, for the last one just now. But uh, I just want to remind that, that the, the three, the central approaches to populism are three the ideational, the strategic, and the discursive, and each of them have pros and cons. Now, the ideational approach that focuses on uh, populism as an ideology would uh, <clears throat> be, uh, it's very empirically oriented. Uh, and, as, and that's why, as I said, it's used primarily by political scientists. Uh, <clears throat> it, um, because it says populism, uh, it gives a minimal definition of populism as having only a couple of core characteristics and then it has to be uh, combined with other, other ideologies. Uh, it's easy through this approach to construct uh, ty typologies uh, such as uh, inclusionary and exclusionary or left and right populism. Uh, and uh, it's easy to apply um, to, to apply to different historical and geographic contexts. And also it sees populism as an inherent feature of a movement or an actor. So it's, you're either populist or you're not, if you have these characteristics. So, so um, it, it's kind of very helpful for, for empirical type of research. Uh, but uh, the problem is exactly that it's empirically oriented because basically there is no underlying uh, kind of robust philosophy behind this. So there are differences that, that's, that causes also disagreements between those who are in this camp between, uh, for example, uh, Jan Werner Müller, who would say that, uh, um, you know, Syriza is not populist and uh, others um, who would disagree. Um, and, uh, um, and basically there, there, the, the lack of, of uh, conceptual cl clarity is present there and creates uh, disagreements. Um, now the strategic approach, as I said, is used by sociologists and they will, and the problem there is that it's too limited into, in, in where it can be applied and has been kind of developed. This approach has been developed mainly with a focus on Latin America and um, cannot be kind of used to explain um, uh, populism in other contexts. And the discursive approach is, too, I say, too theoretical to, 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 and what I mean here is that it is bound to all this philosophy that I just described of Laclau and Mouffe, which is, has specific epistemological commitments and, uh, and, and ontological commitments, uh, and speaks about neoliberalism and hegemonies and the construction of identities and all this and Lacanian psychoanalysis and so on. So it is a little, um, uh, kind of too much bound to specific normative commitments. Uh, so in that sense, it's, uh, um, it's uh, too much of a um, top-down approach from theory to practice, uh, which is also how Mofa sees it now to inspire uh, actual partisan strategy. But the good thing with both the strategic and the discursive approach is that they are, uh, they can travel, uh, the, um, sorry, the discursive approach can travel. The good thing about the strategic and the discursive is that they see populism as a, in gradational terms, as different degrees. So you can be a little bit called populism or more or much more and so on. It's not either or. Um, that's always helpful. Um, yes. And um, to round up this first part, I want to also go a little bit into 
uh, Urbinati is not the Urbinati classification scheme and critique um, because she then wouldn't divide the approaches in these three types, but she would just talk about focusing on the theory aspect on minimalist and maximalist theories of populism. So basically the first two, the, the, the strategic and ideational would be minimalist theories, which see populism as having few defining characteristics. And the pop maximalists would be like Laclau, which has, um, which kind of, a const um, which um, um, builds um, a whole philosophical framework uh, that ends up uh, um, uh, seeing populism as a synonym of politics and democracy, and that democracy can only be, be populist, and politics can only be adversary in the way that populism is ad adversarial. So it's, it's maximalist in that it uh, tends to see populism as necessary everywhere, in a way. Um, and the problem, she says, with minimalist theories is that they are conceptually unclear, as we saw earlier, and uh, one example is that she, a couple, a few examples are that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, um, the distinction between, oh, I have it here, yeah, uh, between um, uh, honest, uh, honest, uh, and honest um, kind of people, the many that are honest and the few that are corrupt is a distinction that we already see in republicanism. So it's not, it cannot be the defining characteristic of populism because we see it in other kind of previous type of, um, of traditions of thought. Um, and and um, uh, likewise, the idea that a lot of these minimalist theorists stress that uh, populism is only opposed to liberal democracy, not to democracy per se, is for her problematic because uh, how can you have democracy without uh, uh, liberties? Uh, it would be a defunct democracy. So, so that means that populism by being against these liberties is also anti-democratic per se. So basically because they lack a, a coherent uh, philosophies of democracy, these theories, they come, uh, they, come they, 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 they come to dead ends, let's say. Whereas maximalist theories, of course, are politically too risky because, you know, she says, like Lau and Mufti, do not tell us what, um, uh, what, uh, what will happen after this conflict that they propagate, this political conflict and, and, and counter hegemony that uh, populists should um, bring about. What was, and, and after that, we should always be, um, what will they do when they come in power, the populists? Will they... Uh, accept opposition or because they think that then the morally pure people are in power, they should um, uh, get rid of all the um, all others that they would call elite. And so it's very risky. And we will end up, she says, with factional governments, either speaking in the interest of the few or in the many, but in, in, in both cases, it would be factional that they would uh, fight the opposition um, uh, and kind of eliminate the opposition, and then you know, one party state or whatever. Um, so that would be Urbinati's theory. Um, and that, I hope that by now we have some more ideas of what populism is and how many different views there are of what populism is. If I may have a sip of water. And now we can talk about how populism relates to other ideologies. And uh, first, I will, I will talk about three ideologies particularly. One is nationalism, the other is socialism, and the third is liberalism. And that's all taken by a book that was published last year by Ben Moffitt on, uh, well, it's called Populism. And um, Nicholas knows about him. Uh, it's very, very. Uh, from all the books, I found it the most, uh, the most, the best suited for and as an introduction to populism because the field is really immense right now, and uh, many, uh, many theories and many approaches that are um, kind of using different understandings, as you hopefully have seen by now. 
So um, first, uh, how does populism relate to nationalism and what does it share? It does share certain features with nationalism, namely, <clears throat> especially in the right wing populist, radical right wing populist uh, variety, we see uh, populism go hand in hand with with uh, nationalism, and we have here the kind of main <laughs> figures that do that: Trump, uh, Marine Le Pen, and Viktor Orbán. And of course, uh, there are other right-wing um, populists uh, that are also nationalists. Uh, what 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 uh, is particularly in common is that both the nationalists and the right-wing populists uh, use the same vocabulary of um, in group versus out group, out group, us and them, right? They would both do that. Um, but how do we, should we see this uh, relation? And, uh, and uh, here, Klein and Stavrakakis are useful uh, because they uh, suggest that this should be seen as two distinct discourses, the nationalist and the right-wing populist but the, 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 that are closely involved in constructing their respective categories. Um, so, uh, and if we, we compare them, we will also start seeing the differences. So on one hand, uh, one difference is uh, on uh, the question of who is represented. And for the nationalist, uh, that's the nation, and that's usually constructed, understood as a community, either in ethnic terms or in other kind of uh, conservative terms, historical terms, uh, linguistic terms, it's, but it's the nation. Whereas the populist nationalists would, uh, would have as a key category the people, and the people, as we say, would be understood as opposed to an elite. So uh, they're not exactly doing the same um, uh, when they talk about who is the, uh, the kind of the political agency that needs to, they, the, they as a leader needs to represent. And how do they construct the other? That's another difference. Uh, the, uh, the nationalists would define them as the non-nationals, the immigrants, if you like, the foreigners. And the populist um, uh, populist nationals would include both the non-nationals, foreigners, immigrants, so and the elite. However, they define this. And in that sense, they also uh, understand understand uh, power relations as being structured differently for um, the um, uh, the populist nationalists. Um, the um, uh, 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 powers are divided horizontally, and uh, for the uh, for the nationalists uh, vertically. No, sorry, I'm, I think I, I confused this. So, uh, for the nationalists, it's horizontal in the sense that it's us and them, the foreigners, but the populists would also see it as the elite and the people, vertical. Um, and uh, and then populist nationalists are also pro democracy, right? Uh, whereas the, uh, the the ethnic nationalists they detest democracy. I mean, ethnic nationalists qua fascists. So there is also this difference. Um, so the problem, the, the question is not uh, uh, if somebody is uh, uh, a populist or a nation nationalist, but whether these two are articulated together because they do, uh, they can be combined in, in the way that I just described. Um, another distinction is uh, between uh, uh, the populist right and the populist left in the way they relate to nationalism. And here, uh, the differences are quite striking in that the populist strike right do I uh, see the people as a national group, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, that uh, and this group excludes ethnic or cultural minorities, and they also use the language of nativism, so the original, the origins that they are originally from there, um, the the people the, as they define them, 
uh, and uh, they are opposed to uh, an elite that is transnational and multicultural. So it's always the progressives in the centers of power that are pushing for this very pro-immigrant, very pro-diversity, pro multicultural agendas, they would say. And the populist left instead uh, would um, uh, not define the people in ethnic or racial terms and uh, be more uh, inclusive and, and kind of uh, ad adopt a civic patriot patriotic agenda at, uh, most usually. Uh, for them, the kind of enemy is uh, um, the transnational economic elite, uh, I see IMF. And, uh, and what needs to be defended is national economic sovereignty. So they relate differently to how nation and nationalism is important to them, the left and right populists. Oops. Yes. So if we now we turn to the relation of populists to socialists, how am I doing in terms of time? Um, we see similarities here between between them, that they both emphasize collectivists, collect, collectivism, and, um, and that uh, pe people is seen as hardworking, they distrust elites, they emphasize economic equality, especially the left uh, populists, and they emphasize direct participation, which was important also for socialists with the council, council democracy, if you've heard of that. And uh, they also both see um, the tri triumph of the people as a unidirectional kind of um, end of his um, um, uh, pathway, historical pathway that this is where we should go and we, we will go um, towards. But there are differences here, namely that uh, whereas socialists emphasize uh, class struggle uh, for populists, as we saw, it is class cooperation is this different demands from different social classes that are combined to create the people. And uh, um, whereas socialists would be uh, anti-capitalists, the um, uh, populists usually both in practice and in theory to the extent that they talk explicitly, they theorize explicitly about their economic agendas, which they don't, but to the extent they do, they are, um, not talking about uh, abolishing capitalism altogether, like a Marxist would say, but to keep low import capitalism, but just to decrease uh, trade, um, um, uh, trade imp import, um, importing goods and so on, um, global trade. And yes, uh, so the class character is missing from the populist understanding of the people. Um, and also class essentialism is missing, as I earlier explained, where democracy is understood as, as comp composed by pluralistic, um, uh, pluralistic kind of elements. Now, um, Last, we have the relation of uh, populism to liberalism, and that's a very kind of uh, very much discussed relation. Uh, all the uh, political scientists would say that populism is illiberal, is democratic, but it's it's against democracy. Sorry, it's not against democracy, but it's against liberal democracy. So it's basically liberalism that it opposes. Uh, they call they have called it illiberal democracy or democratic liberalism and that and that's because <coughs> excuse me populism is seen as emphasizing homogeneity uh, that uh, there's single cleavage uh, political cleavage uh, electoral cleavage if you like the people uh, and um, the elite and uh, they target minorities they talk about adversarial politics we have to, to fight and so on and they are opposed to independent institutions and, um, uh, and constitutional guarantees, if you like, and uh, they lack respect for human rights. 
where, where, whereas liberals would be the exact opposite of each of these characteristics. They would be pluralist and, and talk about multiple uh, electoral cleavages, women, immigrants, I don't know, uh, and, uh, province, uh, city, and so many, many multiple cleavages. Um, they would um, uh, speak up for minorities and the protection, constitutional protection. They would be more for consensus politics. We deliberate and we agree in parliament and uh, in peace and with reason. And uh, society should be open. So there should be these independent um, institutions uh, and uh, freedom of speech clearly and uh, uh, individual liberties protected. So they, so the two are opposed, I, a lot would say. But um, there's reason to be careful when we uh, design an, uh, this dichotomy, because basically what, what does make one liberal is uh, not so straightforward because someone could be liberal or could talk like a liberal and is it enough if someone could talk like a liberal and the reason is that the what emerged lately is uh, especially in northern europe some right-wing populists that pose as liberals and they defend enlightenment values the sexual permissiveness gender equality and free speech and uh, christian secular secularism drug use and so on, prostitution euthanasia, I'm talking about the Netherlands, the Swedish Democrats, the Sweden Democrats and so on. They, um, and they, uh, while at the same time opposing a multiculturalist elite immigration and Islam. And uh, an um, interesting example that Ben has in his book is, is uh, uh, as a quote by Pim Fortuyn from the Netherlands who said, well, I have nothing against Moroccans. I've been to bed with so many of them to underline how much they're in favor of sexual permissiveness. So in that sense, how liberal they are. But of course, he already in this phrase essentializes Moroccans as being uh, all the same and all kind of uh, um, an identifiable part of the population that should be uh, seen as this distinct. Um, and uh, kind of dealt with. Uh, so to some extent also uh, basically they are, um, this approach to liberal values is ve very double-faced because, and, and, and the, it has been called liberal liberalism because they would emphasize on one hand gender equality and we want to defend our societies against, uh, our women's liberties against uh, Islamic uh, whatever. Uh, Islamic values, so we are anti, anti um, Islam, uh, so, you know, Islamophobic. But uh, at the same time, women should be have a more conservative role in the family. So it's very double faced. We are in favor of free speech because we should be able to say, talk, speak up our minds against whoever we want, and you know, hate speech and so on. So in favor free speech, absolutely. But we don't want Quran to be. Published, published. So it's very double, double standards that we see here. So um, it's uh, interesting to to be uh, exactly careful when we uh, try to um, uh, analyze the relation of populism and liberalism. What is useful is to think of liberalism as having, as as not being one. We have different types of liberalism, and uh, maybe populists are uh, kind of compatible with one specific type of liberalism and not with others. So uh, the, the, the liberalism that is called enlightenment liberalism would emphasize reason and autonomy. And they um, I would uh, to some extent, um, but probably not be compatible with that. But then there is a certain liberalism that is called romantic liberalism, where what matters is self-expression and self-disclosure at all costs. And that type of liberalism probably we see in populists that they say, I want you know <coughs> my hate speech to be allowed. Uh, and I'm, in that sense, I'm liberal. Uh, um, Sorry, 
Yeah. At the same time, we see left-wing populists to defend a more plural and heterogeneous view uh, of the people in racial, ethnic, gender, and sexual identity terms, as well as socioeconomic background. And then, um, and that makes them kind of less inimical to liberalism that is usually assumed, uh, and certainly less so than right-wing populists who want to exclude uh, parts from the population. And here, perhaps, we see more of a reformation liberalism, as we say, which is a, a liberalism focused on diversity and tolerance. Um, so different, so, so they probably, populists altogether may be incompatible with an enlightenment type of liberalism, which focuses on reason, but kind of selectively uh, compatible with some kind of reformation liberalism, the left wings, and some kind of romantic liberalism, the right wing populists. And uh, so it all depends on what counts as liberal. And uh, if what matters is accepting multiple accounts of the good in society, then populists are not so liberal. And uh, they often attack in practice free speech and media and independent institutions. And that's why we have um, this, uh, this uh, what we call institutionally liberalism. So they're, it's not part of their philosophy, but it's really part of their um, practice to attack these institutions. Um, whereas conservatism would be philosophically opposed to liberalism. Um, populism is opposed to liberal institutions specifically. But also we see a lot of, um, um, of uh, differences between populists. Um, sorry. I think I skipped. Uh, A slide. Oh, no, oh, sorry, it's further down. And uh, to now, uh, I'm eating a lot of uh, of the break time, I think. Uh, but uh, I will also like to discuss the last part on uh, re the relation of populism and democracy. To some extent, I have already talked about it, and uh, I hope that there will, will be a good amount of repetition so that we are all um, uh, take uh, certain key messages home from this lecture. But of course, populism has often described as being the enemy of democracy. But uh, this is not straightforward again, because, you know, which democracy? <laughs> so liberal Democrats do tend to see populism as, as a threat to constitutional checks and balances and minority protection. But radical Democrats do see it as a hope that it will reconstitute the people and shake up the post-political landscape. So again here, which democracy are we talking about? And uh, 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 of course, liberal Democrats say that populism does harm democracy because it has this homogenous view of the people and refuses to recognize their positions as le legitimate. Um, uh, the opponents' uh, views are usually not seen as valid or acceptable, so, uh, and only the populists express the true voice of the people. Um, but uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, they are not philosophically opposed to liberalism uh, to, uh, yeah, to liberalism as Christian Democrats were, but uh, to institutional liberalism. And, um, uh, and to the, the degree to which uh, liberties are, one could be opposed to liberties, but in favor of democracy is also debated because to what extent can we talk about these two uh, as being distinct from each other? Um, now, uh, Urbinati would argue that populism is a politics of partiality that basically replaces the open nature of the people as a constituent power, as the people being the groundwork of democracy. Uh, for populists, this is not an open um, agency, an open kind of a collective, but it is very specific, it's a majority that they mobilize. And then this majority that votes for us, let's say, is the people. So it's a radical majoritarianism uh, that does not 
have room for the opposition, as we said. Uh, and it's very important that they consider uh, that they should be directly represented by the leader. And this, uh, in that sense, for her, the, the process of representation collapses uh, because uh, the, usually in elections, we have uh, a time lapse between uh, will formation and a judgment. So the whole pre-election debates, if you like, in the moment of the vote. And, and here this whole process collapses and it becomes just the leader, what he says or she says, and that's representative of the people. No intermediaries, no discussion, no um, kind of acclamatory type of elections. And that's something that basically does away with our concept of the party, of, of what parties do. The parties become a little bit irrelevant. The, the leader becomes the party, she says. And in that sense, populism disfigures democracy, namely party democracy and all the intermediaries, the independent, independent institutions. As I said, party, the party becomes a kind of uh, an instrument for the populist leader. Um, but uh, on the other hand, you would have radical Democrats say that, uh, no, I mean, populism is the way to do democracy, because if there is no people, there is no democracy. And, and the people is constituted by raising this uh, dem equivalent demands against the common enemy, as Laclau says. And as Mufa says, democracy needs conflict and partisanship. The moment you kind of talk about consensus democracy like the liberals do, then you don't have democracy anymore. So you need to, uh, to bring in more partisanship and agonism, as she says, to rebalance the oversized liberal pillar, which is one that uh, is, uh, overly emphasizes uh, neoliberal, both institutions and economics and rights, individual rights and so on. We need more collective agency. Um, and, uh, and in that sense, populism is good for democracy because it repoliticizes it and puts the people back at the center of uh, uh, political life. So to end with uh, these reflections, these reflections about populism and democracy, why should we conflate? populism with anti-democratic movements, with authoritarianism specifically? What is there something to gain or is it, is, can, be, can it be even done? Uh, well, it, can, it cannot, uh, Ben, and I would agree with him, says, because uh, uh, populists themselves sometimes emerge in opposition to authoritarian movements, such as the solidarity movement in Poland was a populist movement which was fighting against repressive communist governments, or in Thailand, the populists rose against the military junta. So it's not as easy to just claim that they are the authoritarians. And, and, um, and what else is being observed lately is a certain uh, kind of current, um, certain um, tendency to, to be anti-populist, which means one projects one's own liberal ideology into a negative stance towards populism. Um, so, uh, so, so because populists are seen as, as non-liberals, one says that makes them also non-democratic and we should all be against populists in the name of democracy. But that's one and one-sided view of populism and of a specific type of populism also. Uh, so, but, but also it, it's not useful to forget that populism has a problematic relation with democracy because they do overemphasize the role of, of the leader. And uh, uh, that has um, in practice often led to centralized decision-making, often to corruption and to non-democratic practices in Venezuela and so on. So it is important to keep an eye on, on, on populist democratic credentials. At the end, populism has both democratic and anti-democratic tendencies. So uh, this has been the bulk of my lecture. Uh, and uh, in addition to keeping in mind that populism is uh, 
has a double-sided uh, um, relation to democracy, it also has a double-sided relation to the other types of ideologies, socialism, nationalism, and liberalism. And let's not forget that also what is populism itself and how to approach it is also being debated as we speak. So with this uh, amount, uh, with a great amount of puzzle, in your head, I'd like to end this lecture. Thank you.